You know, Mark, you and I spent a fair amount of time over the years talking with policymakers, and I think three things have jumped out, at least to me overall. I mean, the first is the basic divide in language and experience among policymakers and politicians and business and tech types. It's just, it's so wide that it's hard to have a conversation about tech potential generally, let alone AI in particular. And second, among the most tech forward policy leaders we've gotten no overall, they'll tell you that AI is a top three priority, but their inboxes are so full with business as usual in today's crisis that almost anything medium or long term seems to get to the bottom of the list. And finally, you know, all these guys and women, man, I mean, the incentives for them is to protect the downside, right? There's not a lot of reward. They don't get a bonus if they take a shot and goal and things work, but they can have a terrible downside for their seat at the table or their career or whatever, if in fact they do something and it, it doesn't work. We know a lot of good people in policy around the world. We know something big is afoot. They know something big is afoot. You've talked to world leaders. How can policymakers and legislatures so it's best really unleash this potential. <laughs> yeah, so, well, at least we, you know, we started with the small questions. Um, so, um, I mean, look, like, I think everything that you said is correct. Um, I mean, like in a sense, there's a lot of unfairness in the dynamic, which is just, you know, technology has gotten very complicated. Um, and, you know, at least in the U.S., you know, the center of, of technological development in the U.S. is, is Silicon Valley, which is 3,000 miles away from D.C., um, which it, it turns out is still a, a, a long way, even with uh, airline flights and with Zoom. Um, it's, it's still a, a massive divide. Um, and of course, you know, policymakers, you know, by, by, by their nature have to be general, generalists, right? Um, or at least the, the, the sort of leaders have to be generalists. And so, you know, these things get incredibly specialized and it's hard to, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to expect them to become expert on, on everything. Um, you know, I, I mean, quite honestly, the, the divide, the divide, the divide, you know, the divide, I would say, in the levels of knowledge in both directions are, you know, at a low point in my life um, <laughs> and falling. Um, the cultural divide is, a, is, is, is wider than ever. Um, the level of mistrust between the uh, between the worlds is, is higher than ever. Um, you know, if you if you go back and you read, you know, what it was like 50 or 60 or 70 years ago. Um, with, uh, you know, and, this, you know, sort of most famously recently is, you know, Oppenheimer, um, you know, the movie, you know, kind of shows this, you know, very tight integration between the scientific technical community and the government, you know, which led to American and Western, you know, military and economic supremacy, which led to winning the Cold War and so forth. Like, you know, those, <laughs> those days are over. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, the overall situation is not great. Um, you know, when, when I talk to people on both sides, you know, what I what I like to stress is is the need, you know, starting out for humility, um, which is I think that, um, you know, I think those of us in the tech world need to be humble um, about our level of understanding of global affairs and of politics and of policies. Um, and there's, of course, the assumption, you know, there's always a sort of tendency to assume that, that you know, we're, we're smart in one area. And so we're smart in every area. And so we should be able to, you know, kind of tell everybody else how to live and what to do. Um, you know, I think there should be, you know, frankly, some humility also coming from from the policy uh, domain, um, you know, that these technology issues are actually complex. Um, that it actually is important to deeply understand the technology. And if you don't, it actually is a real challenge. And then I think the two sides really need to learn from each other. Um, and really need to come together and spend a lot more time together. Um, and then say that would be nice. I would say it's not. It's not. It, it, it happens occasionally, and you know maybe this discussion hopefully is a good example of that. But um, it, it's definitely not the theme of the day. The, the theme of the day is, I would say, increased division and separation. I mean, look, I agree there was an old playbook. The old playbook would be that technology would do what it does and it kind of goes out into the market. And then once the regulators start to kick in, then you'd have to deal with them. And we're in this position where. A lot of your, you know, sisters and brothers out there have come to Washington and other capitals in the world to talk about this ahead of, quote unquote, the bomb going off. I don't think we've seen anything like this, actually, in history. It suggests that there are risks here that should be or need to be regulated. How should we think about that? What, in fact, is risk that has to be taken seriously ahead of the curve, even if there's going to be an exercise in humility and we'll obviously learn together as time passes? Yeah. So, you know, look, to so start by, you know, giving the devil his due. So, um, you know, it is, it is, you know, it's always the case that technologies change, uh, you know, society, technologies change societies, they change social structures, uh, they change political structures, they change distributions of power. Um, Marshall McLuhan had a great line. He said, uh, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. Um, and so, you know, look, there, there is, you know, with any new technology, there is going to be, uh, you know, recalibration, you know, in, any new fundamental technology, obviously, again, using an analogy, which is a dangerous one, but, you know, nuclear, nuclear power, obviously, uh, nuclear technology obviously changed the balance of power in the world dramatically. Um, you know, look, it's also, again, uh, to give the devil is due, look, the internet really changed things, right? And the, the internet was sort of released, you know, the internet was sort of released into the world under the previous ethos that you described, which is kind of, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, you know, 
this is like a marvelous new technology for letting people communicate. Let's see what people do with it. And I, yeah, I think especially a lot of incumbent policymakers and politicians, you know, very, very much deeply regret being hands off. And, you know, frankly, they look at the American internet, you know, kind of system as it exists today and then the Chinese system. And I think they actually kind of wish they had the Chinese system. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you could like harness the thing, you know, that might be better than having it just be used against you all the time, which is, which is what a lot of, a lot of people in the policy area kind of, kind of feel like now. Um, and so, you know, like, I, I think, you know, there's some truth to all of that. Um, you know, in the case of AI specifically, you've, you've had this kind of thing, which, as you said, is kind of new and unprecedented, which is you've had a rush of kind of early industry figures, uh, you know, kind of show up in Washington and in, in Brussels and in London, you know, sort of screaming about the, the, you know, the sky is falling, you know, existential risk and all that. Um, you know, I, I wrote in my, my essay on AI, I wrote that this, I view kind of that as sort of an un unholy alliance between two groups of people. Uh, the people I call the uh, the Baptists, which are the the true believers, the you know the people who are kind of truly kind of in this mode of where they're kind of you know very very worked up about about the risk of AI, and, and there are some people like that who who really believe. And then there, there's also a lot of what what we call the bootleggers, which is basically people looking to establish regulatory bar regulatory barriers, right, to get regulatory capture. And and you know in the time honored tradition of these kinds of movements, you know basically the bootleggers are the, the Baptists are true believers, but the bootleggers are cynical opportunists. Um, and they're, you know, they're very commercially self-interested and they're trying to establish regulatory barriers against competition. Um, you know, I would say, I, I guess the good news, I was in D.C. three weeks ago. I, I was there late last year as part of one of the Senate hearings um, that Senate leadership was putting on. And then I was there again three weeks ago uh, as a follow up to that. And I, I, I guess if there's if there's progress, it's that the doom saying is not really working. Um, the, 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 the sort of fever pitch of, oh, my God, end of the world that was happening last year that I always thought was silly um is is sort of, i i think basically people in washington are not that you know they're actually fairly sharp uh they're fairly wise to the ways of the world and they figured out that that that's not actually the case um and then uh, i think they i think also the bootleggers overplayed their hand um and went too overtly for regulatory control and at least the conversations i had last week with or two three weeks ago with senators and congressmen they were kind of laughing about the sort of overt kind of regulatory grab and uh, you know and and it's really funny because these are like big tech companies. These are big tech companies coming to Washington and asking for regulatory protection. And like, if there's one thing that Washington hates, it's big tech. Um, and so I, I've been quoting Emperor Palpatine a lot in the uh, in these conversations. It's just you know just just let the hate flow through you, right? <laughs> just like, you know, if big tech wants it, don't do it. Um, and so I, it feels like the fever is breaking a little bit. You know, now it's getting more into the nuts and bolts. Um, and the nuts and bolts are basically in two parts. Uh, one is funding, uh, which is the politicians really want to hand out money. Uh, and so they, they want to attach, you know, AI to various spending programs, uh, which, which is fine. Uh, it's part of, you know, status quo politics. And then the other is regulatory action. And, you know, in lieu of major legislation, which now seems unlikely, uh, just, you know, given what's happening these days in Washington, at least, um, you know, the, the regulatory agencies are being unleashed, which, which will have its own consequences. Um, I, I still worry about regulatory capture. I still worry the government's going to basically authorize a cartel here. Um, and, and we're still going to fight against that, but it, you know, it's, it's at least at the moment trending in the right direction. Uh, by the way, e EU things are going much worse, um, right. and uh, you know, the EU actually did pass this this big this big thing, and then I, also things in the UK are not trending well. Um, and so I, I would say that I would say that the EU is living up to the stereotype, which is they're just going to regulate everything to death and just guarantee that their companies, you know, basically can't play. Um, and then uh, the Americas just kind of kind of kind of muddle along um, and kind of, you know, kind of accidentally do some of the right things and probably also screw up a bunch of stuff. One of the things that I picked up and I was just in Europe uh, for a month, actually talking to a lot of leaders there is there's almost this low burn uh, construct, which is great. Another major new technology that America is going to set the rules of the road. But of course, We'll come back and talk about China separately, but you know, they'll say, well, China also. How should the rest of the world be thinking about their participation in this? I mean, it's all well and good to say Europe is a side to step out and regulate, but they may be also saying, but it's hard for us to play. Like where this is, in fact, going to be another American dominated thing. And maybe again, China and UK and Saudi will raise their hands, but but it's not going to necessarily be the same. How should the rest of the world and even entrepreneurs in the rest of the world be thinking about this change? Yeah, so let's actually hit the U.S.-China thing first, just because it sort of sets the playing field for everybody else. Sure. Um, it's, it's, the U.S. and China are technologically defining the playing field that I think everybody else has to cope with, um, for better or for worse. So, so yeah, so so look, so so yes, as you point out. So first of all, the U.S. is not just alone in this. Um, there is another technological superpower that has you know primary R and D and a very large domestic market and a ton of government support. Um, and very aggressive private companies and and you know a giant research complex and that, and that's China. Um, and so, um, you know, it, 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 we, we do live in a technologically bipolar world in basically every area of key technology, and that includes that includes AI. 
Um, uh, the, 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 this results in a sort of a very sort of interesting thing in my conversations in D.C., which basically they're they're I was describing as schizophrenic and they're even schizophrenic when I talk to the exact same person, which is it's like on Tuesday, we'll have a conversation about AI in the U.S. as if the U.S. is the entire world. And then it's all about what the government, yeah. what the U.S. government needs to do to constrain or control AI. And then on Wednesday, we'll have a completely different conversation, which is U.S. versus China geopolitically, economically, militarily. Um, and then the spheres of influence, you know, globally. Um, and, and there the discussion will be, well, we have to make sure the U.S. beats China. Uh, we have to make sure that U.S. the U.S. industry beats Chinese industry. The U.S. You know, nation beats the Chinese nation. And we have to make sure that the American, you know, kind of the American led sphere of global influence in technology, um, you know, beats, beats the Chinese sphere of influence. And, you know, they're, they're diametrically opposed. Right. It's like the same U.S. government that wants to control us for domestic reasons, wants us to win uh, internationally. They're, 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 they're literally diametrically opposed. And, and it will come as no shock to you to say that there's no attempt in D.C. that I've seen to, to try to reconcile <laughs> these, these two, at least at least not right now. I mean, look, for better, or for worse, we do not have a national technology strategy. Right. Um, and by the way, there's a lot of good in not having a national technology strategy, which is, you know, we, we, we believe free markets you know, are, are still important. Uh, it's not like we want the government to control everything. But the fact is, we have no no national technology strategy, certainly no national AI strategy. Um, you know, look, China is the other player. Uh, and, and then, of course, China has the strengths and weaknesses they have, which is the, the strength they have is they do have a national policy. They have a, they have a very aggressive and clearly stated national policy. Uh, to win in technology and to win in AI. The, they have a very clear and articulated view of what that means for inside China as well as globally. Um, they're going to take their AI technology and philosophy and, and approach the global. They're taking it to, they're going to take it to all the same countries they took 5T to and all the same countries that they took Belt and Road to. And, and, and you know, and they, and they have a pitch, uh, you know, with that. Um, and it, it's a pitch that involves, you know, a, a lot of pretty interesting arguments for a lot of countries, including, you know, broader alliances with China, offsetting U.S. power, and then also, quite frankly, just like population control. Um, you know, I think the rulers of a lot of countries kind of wish they had the Chinese internet model rather than the American internet model. And, you know, if AI is going to be important like the internet was, then they want the Chinese AI model, not the American AI model. And so th there, there's, a big, uh, there, there's a big battle uh, forming up. Um, you know, every place else is kind of, you know, sort of like the Cold War, U.S. versus U.S. society. Like everywhere else, at least for the next few decades, I think is going to be kind of reacting to what happens in the U.S. and China. Um, but, you know, and there are smart people in many other places and there are, you know, AI startups in lots of other countries, but there's just a center of gravity to the U.S. and China that's just bigger uh, than anywhere else. And so the, uh, many other countries are going to have to figure out kind of which side of this divide, you know, how, how do they want to kind of play these two sides off against each other uh, and where do they want to land? You know, Europe is the clearest, you know, example of somebody that's just, you know, kind of stuck in the middle. We saw this play out with 5G where there was this, you know, huge, you know, very dramatic thing that's still playing out, which is, you know, should European countries adopt the Huawei, you know, 5G model? What would it mean for Europe's telecommunications systems to get built on top of Chinese infrastructure? And, you know, the American reaction to that was like, are you insane? And, the you know, the Europeans were like, well, we don't necessarily just want to be, you know, vassal states of the U.S. And, you know, we want to be also close to China. And so there, there's going to be a very similar kind of dynamic, uh, I think, playing out uh, in Europe around AI. And then, you know, look, Europe, Europe has just gone all in on regulation. And they they literally say with a straight face things like, well, we know we can't win on the commercialization of technology, so we're going to win on the regulation. Um, and, of course, that's just, like, completely insane. Um, and because, like, you, you can't be an effective regulator if, like, you don't actually have an AI industry, right? Like, and if you're not willing to adopt the technology and you hate it, so you're regulated, you know, sort of essentially ban it. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and, and you can see the, the, the fruits of this strategy, you know, kind of in real time, which is, you know, 20, 30 years ago, if you made a list of the top 50 technology companies in the world, a, a fairly large percentage of them were European. Um, and now it's down to, you know, top 50 tech companies in the world. It's, you know, the number that are European is either one or zero. Yeah. Um, and, and then correspondingly, you see that in, you know, very low rates of economic growth uh, uh, in, in, in Europe or, or even, you know, economic, actual, actual economic decline, you know, stagnation uh, with all kinds of downstream consequences for their economics and their politics. And so they, you know, they're, they're like, they seem to be in like some sort of suicide move, as far as I can tell. They, they seem to want it. They seem to like it. The constituent states seem to want it and like it. You know, England, Britain looked like it, didn't like it and didn't want it. And so they deliberately separated out, but they still continue the same kind of overly reg regulatory approaches for reasons I don't fully understand. Um, and so, I, you know, they're just going to like regulate themselves and, you know, the, Europe's just going to regulate itself into a wall. Um, there is a bright spot, interestingly, which is France. Um, yeah. And uh, we have this company, Mistral, uh, which is one of the leading AI companies um, in France. And the French government actually has been quite supportive of that and actually fighting back on the EU a fair amount. 
Um, and so, um, and, and Mistral is a very, very effective company, AI company. Um, and so, you know, you never know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe the French figure out with Mistral and the Swedes figure out with Spotify and, you know, some of these other places, you know, figure out that actually tech could be a source of growth and opportunity. And maybe they, you know, over time kind of reorient and become, you know, kind of get, get on a more offensive footing. I, I would love to see that happen. Right now, it sounds like kind of an exception that may prove the rule. We just don't know yet. Or are you looking at a whole bunch? You invested there. Are there a bunch of other uh, mistrals coming? Yeah. So there's a really funny thing. It's just really funny thing. Okay. So I'll just, I'll just air, air all the all the all the all the laundry. So um, so basically, like <laughs> the rule of thumb in our world is, you, know, what you always back a European founder who's moved to the U.S. Um, like 100 percent of the time, right? And it's like whether it's a Brit or a German or, or French or or like whatever Eastern European, whatever it doesn't matter, Italian. You just you, you back them all. Which is just to say the human capital in Europe is is is, is still world class. The the education system, you know, is still tremendously good. Um, you know, you have a lot of just like really smart kids who are very fired up and really want to do things. Um, and you know, over the last you know twenty or thirty years, because Europe became so hostile to business and so hostile to startups, um, uh, you know, the, a lot of the sort of best and brightest they they just moved to the U.S. Um, and and then you know we fund them. And a lot of our funders are European, uh, and we fund them, and often away they go. So. So, so the human capital is definitely there. The education system is definitely there. Um, the kid, the kids are there. And I, when I say kids, it's you know each, each new generation has a yeah. set of people in it that's just like very fired up and young and hungry, and they really want to build things. And you know, Europe has a long tradition and history of building things, and and they want to kind of follow in the footsteps and, and build new things. Um, you know, when you ask the European founders who moved to the U.S., why did you move? It's you know, they always say the same thing: is because well, it would have been impossible to build what I'm building in Europe, and it's just like yes. you know, wow. That's weird. Yeah. Like <laughs> that shouldn't be the case. You know, that's really strange. Um, and then, and then, yeah, and then you're right back to the sort of policy questions and then the cultural questions, which is like, okay, how, how could a, how could I revitalize kind of pro innovation, pro capitalism, pro business, pro startup, pro technology Europe, you know, kind of emerge. And there, you know, like, like we said, you, you just, you have to look for the green shoots, the, the, the bright spots, they do exist. Um, you know, the Mistral guys are every bit as, you know, competitive and, 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 uh, and hard edged and effective and smart and curious and, you know, determined as any of our, you know, as, as any of their peers who are in the U S or any of any of their American or, or Chinese counterparts. Um, you know, it's, it's, like I said, it's been sort of, you know, it's been gratifying to see the French government kind of, you know, I think distinctly seem at the moment to understand the opportunity that they have. Well, and not just with Mistral, by the way, there's a whole cluster of AI startups yeah. in Paris. Uh, you know, that's very exciting. By the way, there's a whole cluster of AI. You know, a lot of the key AI technologies were actually developed in London. Yeah. Uh, you know, DeepMind, DeepMind was there, and there's a whole cluster of AI startups there. Um, you know, the UK government's been definitely moving in the wrong direction on that, but maybe they'll figure it out. We're, we're going to end up actually having the, one of the founders of, of both uh, DeepMind and Mistral on this series. So uh, <laughs> I think it's wonderful to get these green shoots out there and people can tell these stories. So it's great for you. You know, as we've been thinking about the 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 kind of the, what gives the policymakers incentives to jump in and understand and also appreciate the things you've been talking about. Among the things I loved in your June post, which we will be sharing with everyone, you know, why AI will, AI will save the world, is that often policymakers have this sort of strange dichotomy that somehow or other you can't unleash the greatness of potential of AI, increase economic well-being, and at the same time you're gonna you will decrease inequality. Like you can't do it all at once. And and your essay makes very clear that in fact you can absolutely do them all, and you have a lot of concrete examples from mal malnutrition, disease, education, climate. This sort of it can't be done. You can't increase what economic well being and decrease inequality. Could you just give a couple of reflections and specifics on that? Yeah. So unfortunately, we we live in a world, and this this continues to be true in the U.S. as well. You hear you hear the same thing in the U.S. Um, it, it's what I to describe as sort of zombie Marxist ideas that are still kind of roaming the roaming the roaming the countryside and coming out and biting us. And and you know, it's kind of the core zombie Marxist idea is that there it, that basically capitalism is an engine of inequality. Um, and and and, the, and by the way, the story is very is very clear. Like it's it's very clear and, and seems very obvious. Which is like, boy, as you mechanize, you basically you know take what had been you know labor that was distributed out. You know, work that had been distributed out in lots of people's hands, you know, individual workers, and you kind of centralize in the form of these large corporations. These large corporations are owned by the capitalists. Um, you know, basically, they they end up making everything because they end up making everything. All the sort of wealth concentrates into those large, you know, institutions. 
Um, and then, you know, th those capitalist enterprises, you know, that's that's the, the Marxist concept of the means of production. And then, of course, you know, the communist revolution is, you know, basically the result of realizing that that's going to lead to stark inequality. And then at some point, the previous workers should, you know, rise up and seize the means of production and then and then reestablish equality. Um, right? So, like, you know, that's, you know, that, you know, that's a 150, 180 year old idea. You know, it, it sort of fits into a lot of our kind of economic and moral intuitions. Uh, it just happens to be really wrong. Um, and, you know, we, we know it's really wrong in several different ways, you know, that we could spend a lot of time on. We know it's really wrong theoretically, which we could talk about. We know it's really wrong historically, um, which is the capitalist economies turned out to be much less unequal than the communist <laughs> economies. And so when we when we ran the A-B tests, like it, it didn't go as predicted, um, right? If you, if you want to start inequality, you go to this, you know, you go to Moscow in 1975, um, right. And, you know, and, and you know, they, you know, communist systems end up, you know, re establishing stark inequality of who has access to food. Right. And yeah. so, <laughs> so like the, communism is a great uh, generator of inequality, it turns out. Um, and then there's just like the, the sort of, the, the, when I say sort of the micro level kind of explanation or kind of the microeconomic explanation for it, which is basically what, what's missed in all that is basically um, what happens to what, what happens, uh, it, it, what happens to prices fundamentally. Um, and so what, what happens is technological advancement, um, which, which in economic terms leads to productivity growth, it, it's a deflationary force uh, at, the level, at the level of prices for products. Um, but it's actually in two parts. First, you create a lot of new products that didn't previous, previously exist because you have an incentive system for doing that for, for entrepreneurship and for invention. And then the other side is you crash the prices of the products that are allowed to, 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 to be the result of a, of a, of a market-driven economy. Um, the, the metaphor that economists use when they explain this, they, they use a phrase, um, the Queen of England always had silk stockings, right? So the richest people in our society always had, you know, you just go right through the list. They always had doctors on call. Um, they always had, you know, um, chefs uh, cooking food for them. They always had people, you know, who were taking care of their lawn. Um, they always had tutors who were teaching their kids one on one. Um, they always had stockings made out of silk. They always had like, you know, beautiful clothes. They, they, they just always had they always had whatever was like the best form of transportation. They always had, you know, horses and buggies or they always had, you know, early on airplanes or like whatever it was. But basically, the super rich and powerful always have, you know, basically the the sort of leading the the sort of peak example of every kind of product or service that you can imagine. And then it's just it's everybody else that doesn't have all that stuff. And then what what the process of technology development and industrialization and capitalism do is they basically take each of those kinds of products and they crash the prices. Um, and by crashing the prices, they basically mean that every, all of a sudden everybody else can have those things. Right. Right. And so and so and this is the this is the other side. And this is the, the part. This is why the Marxism. Kind of model breaks down is it doesn't recognize the other side of what's happening, which is the consumer experience, right? Marxism assumes that everything is a, is a function of production and the consequences of production. What what what? But, but we live life as consumers. Uh, we we live life, you know, our, our our quality of life is measured by what we can buy, you know, with each, with each dollar of income. By the way, there's a, there's a key point in here, which is if you think about the level of income that you have in your life, there there's two ways to get a raise. Right. One is I can get you know the company I work for to pay me more money. The other is everything I buy just got cheaper. Right. And so as technology progresses and makes everything cheaper, then, then basically everybody gets the equivalent of a, of a, of a raise every year. And, and, and look, you, you see this in, in Western households. You know, today you just walk through the Western household and you just you take a look at everything from the refrigerator to the washing machine, to the lawnmower, to the television set, to the music player, you know, to everything. Um, and, and, you know, and the, and the Internet and Wikipedia and Google and, 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 you know, and the iPhone and so forth and everything. And you're just like, wow, you know, and, and the food. Right. And the clothes. Right. And you're just like, wow, like this is a consumer cornucopia that people 50 or 100 or 200 years ago wish that they had had. You know, King Louis the 14th would have probably traded his lifestyle of his era for the lifestyle of a typical upper, upper middle class American today. Like in a heartbeat, you know, you're literally living a better life today than the king than the king of France used to. Um, and so, so that's the other side to it. And that and that's that's that, that's the that's the promise. And, and look, technology and industrialization have been delivering on this for 300 years. It's just this zombie idea that it is increasing inequality as, as opposed to actually reducing it. It's just, it turns out to just be a very hard thing to kill. And how does AI, what, I mean, you did, and again, your essay is fantastic because you just have a list of specifics on it. Yeah. You literally talk about making regular people's life better, in, inequality decrease even more on steroids <laughs> with AI. What are like one or two of your favorite examples? Well, there's, 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 I mean, there are just three, three amazing examples. So, so one is just medicine. Like it, it, the GPT-4 is already a better doctor than most doctors. And, you know, it's considered impolite to say that out loud because everybody gets mad. Like it is true. 
Uh, and it's not a perfect doctor yet, and you wouldn't want to necessarily rely on it completely. But like, you know, th there are lots and lots of reports of people who have like various kind of complex health conditions, and they've gotten correctly diagnosed for the first time by plugging it into even just chat GPT standard version. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of research happening in the kind of biomedical arena to, you know, to, to, to productize all this. But, you know, the, 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 the increase in um, uh, the increase in the quality of healthcare. You know, the idea that you have a world class doctor on tap 24 seven that's happy to talk to you about anything anytime you want. Um, you know, this, this, it, 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 I mean, that just in and of itself is going to be amazing. Um, it's like, what's the number? It's like 200,000 or something people die in the US every year of medical errors, right? It's like, you know, well, that ought to go to zero, right? Like, so there's all these different areas in which you, you ought to be able to improve uh, healthcare through this. Uh, but also, by the way, AI driven drug discovery is starting to work. Um, and so, you know, if, if we stay on track, we're going to have a, a, a big surge in, in, in biomedical research coming out of this, make, make, make a lot of people's lives better. Um, second one is education. Um, you know, every all of a sudden, every kid is going to have a world class tutor, uh, expert, you know, professor with infinite patience and, you know, infinite domain knowledge in every academic field. Um, and, you know, the kid has some issue in math or something and he can't figure out. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden you've got like an infinitely patient, infinitely wise, you know, tutor or teacher that you can talk to uh, to be able to, uh, to, to to solve that problem. And, you know, of course, kids are already starting to to, to use this today. Um, you know, the, 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 the best form of education, just like practically speaking, objectively speaking, the best form of education has always been tutoring. Um, you know, it's, it's always a one-to-one -one relationship between a tutor and a kid. You just don't have, you know, we just, we can't afford to give every kid a human tutor or a human teacher. Um, but we can do that with AI. And so there's, there's, you know, potentially big advances to happen there. And the third is actually, you know, I would say law and government, um, uh, which is just like, you know, again, like GPT-4 is already a better lawyer than most lawyers. Um, you know, there are going to be AI, you know, robot lawyers that are going to be just like incredibly good. Um, and so, you know, the, the sort of average citizen confronted with the power of the state or confronted with the power of big companies um, and, you know, somebody who gets taken advantage of or somebody who gets, you know, screwed on something or, you know, big company does the wrong thing or, you know, you know somebody gets unfairly accused of a crime or, you know, whatever, you know, any of these kind of threats to individual liberty that come from being confronted with these large institutions, you know, that are able to afford lots of fantastic human lawyers. Um, you'll, you'll be able to with AI, individuals will be able to have the ability to, um, you know, to go to to go toe to toe uh, with uh, institutions that have the best lawyers in the world. Um, and so th those are th three just obvious ones off the cuff. And then you could you could easily go through and name another 30. Mark, you know, a lot of people are going to this year is actually not just a big election year for the United States. This is actually one of the largest election years maybe in world history. I and mean, it's happening all around the world. And so people are, even might acknowledge that there's some opportunity to be unleashed. And but at the end, you got to get people who serve in these roles who can actually understand what's happening overall. GMF, we just published a book called the AI Election Security Handbook, and it's got a lot of great suggestions for officials about how to be a little bit defend on the defense of some of the ways that AI could be misused in an election season overall. Someone said to me the best you need to understand that AI is going to be very good at stopping AI. Like, in other words, it can be very good at stopping the bad things. How should we think about the sort of defensive purposes in a, in these kinds of spheres of public debate and elections and that kind of a thing. Yeah, that's right. And so, yeah, look, any, any new technology makes you know new forms of attack possible. You know, in various ways. Um, you know, <laughs> the uh, you know the, the automobile uh, led to you know a wave of nationwide bank robberies. Um, you know, that led to the creation <laughs> of the FBI. Right. So there, there's like a, there's like a long history here of new, new technologies introduce new threats. Uh, you know, obviously the case. Um, but yeah, the, the thing that you look for basically is like, okay, how do you then use the technology to mount a better defense? Um, and what you generally find is the new technology can also be can be used to defend against the new attacks, but the, the new technology can also be used to defend against old attacks that you never actually quite had under control either. Um, uh, so I'll just give you a, a, a great example. A great example, actually, the, the Biden administration actually just came out and said they're doing this, which I, I thought was very good news. Which is, you know, everybody's everybody's you know like legitimately worried about this idea of deep fakes. Um, and so the idea is, um, you know, boy, like, you know, how, how do I know that that really is a video of the president saying, you know, saying whatever, you know, now that you can kind of synthesize those. Um, and so the White House actually announced in this case, they're going to do something I think very smart, which is that they're going to start to cryptographically sign and register all of the official uh, uh, statements and uh, and uh, and and uh, speeches and videos. Um, and so you you will you as a citizen will have a tool, an AI tool, and it will be able to check and it'll be able to see, OK, that's a video of Joe Biden saying X, Y, Z. Did he actually say that? Right. Yeah. And you'll and if he did, you'll know you'll know that he did it because the White House will have cryptographically signed it um, in, a, in an approvable way. Um, and so you will know that that was legitimate. And by the way, if, if the answer comes back, no, this is not cryptographically signed by the White House, then you know that you're probably dealing with fake. Um, right. Um, and so that, you know, that that's the kind of thing that will, you know, first of all, help, you know, kind of defeat deep fakes. But look, this is also the kind of thing that will help defeat other kinds of, you know, misrepresentations and false statements. 
you know, that were slipping through the system that weren't deep fakes, right? You know, people have been able to lie about things other people have said and done, you know, for a very long time before AI. And this is a way to, to you know, to kind of also blunt that. Um, One more. So that, that, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead no, no, go, go. No, that, that, that's how I would, that, 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 that's the framing I would use. Now, the attacks appear before the defenses. And so there, there's a, you know, it, it's up to us in our industry. And this is something my, my firm is working on. Uh, you know, to back the defensive tools and make sure that they get built at everything. But that that seems clearly what 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 will, what will happen from here. One more, just on the kind of this related policy stuff, and then we have a, a question we ask everyone before we let you go because I could keep you for two hours on your on your uh, AI save the world essay alone. But we have a limited amount of time, and we're very grateful that you've given us all of it overall. You you have this wonderful analysis that is very interesting, which is you know at the end of the day, often when there's new technology. Regulators and policymakers tend to think, therefore, you need new policy and regulation. If you argued, if you actually were just very, very good enforcing a lot of what you have, you take care of the lion's share of the problem you're worried about. So is, is, can you just talk a little bit about how regulators and policymakers should be thinking about that and all the things we've talked about today? Yeah, it's so interesting in our society right now, which laws we think we definitely have to like enforce and make tougher versus which laws we no longer think it's important to enforce at all. Um, so, but I guess I'll leave that. I'll leave that topic for for another time. Um, so yeah. So look, the the, the, the <laughs> getting assaulted on the street, no problem. AI deepfake, oh my god. Um, okay. Anyway, <laughs> maybe, maybe that's just because I, I I live near San Francisco. Um, <laughs> so anyway. Um, yeah, look, like this is one of the things. So people talk about quote unquote regulating AI. What they're really talking about, at least I would hope, is regulating basically illegal uses, like like bad, bad uses, you know, things that, that, that damage people, um, right? And so, for example, AI that leads to financial fraud, right? Like, and, and so then the question, the question I think ought, ought always be, well, are there existing laws against financial fraud, right? And the answer is yes. And it's like, well, okay, do those laws apply against AI-driven financial fraud just like they apply to regular financial fraud? And of course, the answer is going to be yes. Uh, and maybe, you know, look, I don't know, maybe the laws need to be amended or adjusted or whatever to take into account the new technology. But like by and large, financial fraud is illegal, you know, great criminal, you know, bank, you know, AI, AI plans a bank robbery. Well, bank robberies are already illegal. AI plans a terrorist attack. Terrorist attacks are already illegal. Planning for a terrorist attack is already illegal. Right. Um, AI is used to help, you know, develop, a, I don't know, some new kind of weapon. Well, developing weapons is already illegal. Right. Like, you know, mass weapons and mass destruction is already illegal. Um, and so I actually think the law enforcement uh, methods, um, uh, the laws are already in place that offset, you know, basically everything that I've heard people worry about, about sort of application of AI to kind of danger X. Um, and so I, I think it's mainly a question of actual, of using the existing, you know, whether it's law enforcement or intelligence, um, you know, capabilities that we already have. And then again, the, the, the other question would be, okay, then how do we augment both uh, law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies uh, to do an even to basically do to do a better job detecting and, and offsetting these kinds of threats, and how do we use these new technologies to do that? Um, and so, you know, you, you may as an example, you may know, like we're, we're very involved now in law enforcement related technologies, and it turns out, you know, you, you can see old things like license plate recognition and you know, facial recognition, all kinds of things to you know actually solve crimes, um, uh, right? And so, you know, all of a sudden you want to you know arm up when when it's, if you're in favor of solving crimes, um, you want uh, you know law enforcement agencies to to be able to use these new technologies to be able to do that, and and then the same thing globally with with the intelligence services. Um, and the so thing that's I, interesting I from, is, yeah, good. I mean, if we had this conversation 10 years ago, five years ago, the thing so powerful about these entrepreneurs of yours that I've met, they're doing this in partnership with the public sector. It's not like they're thinking we're doing it better. It's like we have something that's additive. Let's figure out a way to make our streets safer and so on, right? Yeah, so in, in some cases, and so I, and I will give a I'll, I'll give a bright this is a bright spot. So I, I guess I would say there is a spirit of partnership. That, that I would say there is a growing spirit of partnership or a resurgence of partnership. I would say in particular with the defense and intelligence agencies, um, and then also with law enforcement agencies. That there's a receptivity on the part of those agencies to new technologies that I think is is rising, um, and that that's been noticeable in the last five years. And hopefully the valley and the tech industry is. You know, we, hopefully we're creating the kinds of companies that these that these agencies want to partner with um, and are, are good partners. Um, and so, that, you know, I think I think that is improving somewhat against my overall kind of pessimistic view on the, on the relationship between the worlds. And so that, that that is true. But like, look, like some of these opportunities are emerging because we have voluntarily decided to withdraw state power. Right. Um, and so we, we have this company, Flock Safety, that is a it's a law enforcement. It's our domestic law enforcement. Um, it's a way to sort of pool all security camera feeds in a city and then be able to solve crimes. Um, and it's AI driven and it's like, it's like amazing what flock and like every day flock literally like solves like carjackings and, you know, kidnap children and like, you know, all kinds of horrible things. 
Um, and you're able to do a nationwide sweep, you know, it's like something out of a, you know, 20, you know, a, a, you know, science fiction movie or something where you're able to like find the criminal, um, you know, very, very quickly. You're able to find, you have, for example, you can, you can find cars even if you don't have license plate. Um, right. Um, and so that you, you just say like a visual search engine to be able to find cars based on other distinguishing characteristics, right. And somebody carjacks a car with kids in the back seat, you can find the car, even if you don't have a license plate. And so, and it turns out like, I mean, number one, look, Flock works in conjunction with, um, you know, local law enforcement and it's purchased by and used by local law enforcement, but it, it just turns out there's a lot of local police forces that have a lot of extra budget because a lot of their cops have quit. Right. Um, cause they've decided that, you know, that they're not supported in their communities. Um, and so, you know, it, it, so it's like, okay, if you had fully staffed, you know, police forces in every major American city, maybe you wouldn't even have the budget for this software. As it turns out, that's the opposite. You have the opposite problem. You have too much crime and not enough cops. Um, and so the technology kind of inserts into there, you know, I feel very bittersweet about the success of a company like that because I feel like it's really great because it's technology being used to solve crimes and make people's lives better. And I feel a little bit sad and that, it, you know, the, the opportunity is so clear because we've, we've decided culturally that we want to allow crime to run wild and we want to alienate all the cops. So, you know, but we, we live in the world we live in. So, we'll you know, we'll take it. Well, we have some opportunity to make the world a better place, which is so much the thesis of this and the whole series that we've been doing. So we've, taken, we've kept you too long, Mark, but it was great insight as ever. I'm going to give one last question because we're asking everybody it, it. My own answer, and I do this all the time within the GF, GMF community and elsewhere, is the frankly, a lot of people don't know that Andreessen Horowitz is a venture capital fund that may be one of the greatest content creators about these worlds uh, that I've seen, and, and certainly most objective. I mean, they're very technical and very specific and very, very helpful. But on top of the content you all create, if there are one or two reading or listening things that are sort of must to you in around the AI that you'd love this audience to be be putting on their shelves or or, or beginning to put on their phones, uh, any one or two that just jump out at you? Yeah, so there's two books in particular that I'd recommend that I think pair together really well and kind of really open up your, they really open up my thinking on kind of the downstream societal and political changes from everything we've been talking about. And so one is a book that came out in 2015, a very prescient book um, called uh, the, Revol <laughs> the Revolt of the Public. Yeah. Uh, the Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority uh, in the New Millennium or something like that. Uh, but The Revolt of the Public, the author is Martin Gurry, uh, spelled G-U-R-R-I. And he's a former uh, actually CIA analyst um, who wrote this extremely prescient book um, ba basic on a lot of what we've been talking about. Ba basic, basically, you know, his basic arc is uh, greater access to information especially bottoms up peer-to-peer -peer information is sort of naturally destructive to centralized authority. Um, and that would be the case, even if centralized authority fully deserve respect. Um, but it is certainly the case um, for a centralized authority that actually does not deserve respect. Um, and if you like look at like all of the Gallup surveys, um, you know, for example, of trust in, in institutions, you know, the numbers basically are just all like sharply in decline for across like all of Western societies of all categories of institutions. Um, and I, I think the, the, the and which of course then is sort of dovetails into, you know, sort of the rise of populism and, 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 uh, you know, and so forth. Um, so all these kind of cultural and political things that we all think about these days. Um, anyway, so his book was, it was, it was one of these great, great books. It was, it was pre Trump. Um, you know, it was pre, you know, it was pre, you know, it was pre COVID. It was pre all this, all this recent stuff. Um, and, uh, but I, it, it turns out to be, uh, to be very prescient. Uh, and well worth reading. Um, and then the other book is um, a guy <laughs> whose last name I'm going to butcher, uh, Bruno, and I his uh, I think his name is spelled M A C A E S. Um, okay, I, I Bruno, to... his books are great. Yeah, and so um, uh, he uh, he and I he, he, he and I don't agree on everything, but uh, he has one book in particular that I really like. Um, and uh, Chris, remind me, I'm sure you remember the. Um, uh, what is the I'm not blanking on the book. It's the the beginning of history. History. Oh, history has begun. Yes. History has begun, and it's sort of d deliberately kind of a counterpoint to the famous Fukuyama, uh, you know, end of history. Um, is that the history has begun, and it's a, it's a very clever book that I think about a lot because he basically, uh, these are my words now, but he basically says, okay, if traditional authority is degrading and traditional sources of military and economic power are, you know, are, 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 are you know, are changing, um, and, you know, we have this new landscape, you know, and, and you know, with, with is America is his case study for it. But it's like, you know, if, if America is, you know, America is like fundamentally changing. And, and basically, there's two ways to look at it, which is, you know, sort of America's this systemic decline, which is what a lot of people would say. But he says, no, it's more of a metamor metamorphosis. He says uh, America is becoming a new kind of country and therefore a new kind of, you know, hegemon um, and a new kind of, you know, empire, if you will. Um, and 
uh, sort of the sources of American strength and power in the world are not what they were before, but they're they're, they're new and different, um, and and much more based on uh, technology, um, much more based on actual um, you know, he calls virtual reality, like creation of new realities. Uh, so the, the, the ultimate case study for what he describes is sort of California, right, where I am, which is it's like we, we vertically integrated the creation of new realities in California. We, 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 in Silicon Valley, we create all the, all the technological systems that let you create new realities, including, you know, new social media worlds and new AI worlds, but also like actual virtual reality. Like in the form of things like the Oculus Quest and the Apple Vision Pro and so forth, and then of course Hollywood, right, uh, is actually is the dream factory and creates, you know, new, new, and projects out, you know, a, a sort of a sense of like, you know, what is America? A lot of the, what people view America is is projected out through, you know, movies and television and music and, and cultural artifacts, um, and and you know, and in the old days you would call this soft power, right? And so you you think about the you know teenage kid in Moscow in 1985 who was getting bootleg, pink, you know, bootleg rock and roll records and bootleg Clint Eastwood movies and being like, oh, you know, there's a better and different way to live. Um, and so anyway, the, the modern version of that, and he, he argues that sort of American cultural hegemony is 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 greater and more powerful than ever. Um, and uh, you know, sort of America's sort of special skill at creating a, a virtual worlds is going to be actually very uh, key and important. Uh, in the new era, and a lot of a lot of what we've been describing is kind of revolving around that. And then, and then this this is not real. Oh, I'll give you a third book, and then this translates directly actually into warfare, um, which is uh, playing out, uh, of course, in, in Ukraine right now. Um, you know, which is the you know which is the rise of drones, um, and you know these these kinds of you know the the, the sort of uh, archetypal kind of technological transformation of warfare happening right now is the viral TikTok video of a Russian tank officer. Um, you know, being hunted by a uh, by a by a uh, weaponized Ukrainian uh, drone carrying a grenade, right? Being piloted by a gamer wearing a virtual reality headset, right? Like 20th century versus 21st century. Um, and Chris brought uh, the Kill Chain. The book is the Kill Chain. Yeah, Chris Bros uh, at uh, Andrew uh, wrote this book, Kill Chain. That is the best book on that. And so um, uh, that 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 connects uh, back to the, the previous book. And so I think th th those if if those three books don't don't really expand your for, for me, like they really, I always keep coming back to them because like, okay, I'm not thinking expansively enough in terms of how much things are changing, but those three books, I'll get at it. Fantastic. Mark, there's no greater gift a person can give than that of their time. And and perhaps even a greater gift is a gift of your time that makes us think. We're living in an era where it's very hard to think and it's very hard to sort of step back and you've given us that in spades. So thank you very much for this. We'll get these recommendations. We'll make sure that people uh, see everything you've written and uh, thank you very much. Good. Thank you, Chris. Thank you thank all. You. Bye-bye.